Okay, everyone. So, uh, so in the spirit of this course being a course that takes you from the very basics of regression and linear algebra to the latest in research, um, today we have two guest speakers who are definitely the latest in research and deep learning. Um, Alex Grace, who uh, came up with um, what I think is the best paper of last year, and um, he also helped Carol, uh, who's going to be our next speaker for the next lecture, who I think came up with the, the best paper I've seen this year. This is really amazing work, I'm sure that it will inspire you. So we talked about the neural Turing machine, um, this is Alex's work, and he's done um, a lot of the work that the type of code that you've been using for your, or will be using for your practical LSTMs and so on, you can thank Alex for having made that easier for you. Um, so without much more, um, thank you for coming. Thanks, Nando. Um, so yes, today I'm going to be talking about generating sequences with recurrent neural networks. And so this is based on a paper that I published in uh, 2013 um, on archive. Something's making a sound. It was like a bing. Was I just you? Okay, well that, that's all right. Then. <laughs> and um, yeah, so if you if you if you the paper is obviously still available, so we can you can um, you can look through the, the kinds of things that I'm talking about afterwards. And so the first question to to ask here is you know why do we want to generate sequences in the first place and this kind of speaks to, to generative models in general, like what's so good about generating data? And uh, I understand that Nando has already talked to you a little bit about this, but I'd just like to kind of go through what my, my motivations are for looking at this field, why I think this is so exciting. So there's lots of you know, reasons you can give for why generative models are good. And I think that one of, one of the ones that became popular, especially around the time of sort of 2006 with, with um, deep belief nets and so on was to improve generalization. So there was this idea that you could use generative models or unsupervised models as a sort of pre-training method. Uh, uh, and then once you had done that, uh, you would end up with uh, a supervised model, for example, a classifier typically, that would generalize better. So in other words, even though, even though the, 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 the generative model isn't the thing that you were using in the end, it would, it would help your model learn some kind of better internal <coughs> representation and that would make it a better classifier or whatever it was uh, you were doing with it. Well, another motive is that if you have a generative model, you can use it to create synthetic training data. Uh, personally, I think this is, this is a, a mo you know, something that I often hear people talk about. Personally, I think it's kind of a poor motivation in the sense that you know, it's, it's always better if you can to get your, your data from the real world. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you're generating data with a model and then training another model on that data, then, then you can, you're kind of limited by uh, you know, any, any flaws there were in the original model will be reproduced in the model that you train on them. So then there are also obviously um, actual practical problems that involve generation and, and the one that I'm going to kind of talk about in, in this uh, presentation is, is speech synthesis or text to speech where you know the actual uh, task requirement is, is to generate something that sounds like, uh, like real audio, like a person speaking. Um, one thing that we are very interested in at DeepMind is the potential for uh, sequential generative models to be able to simulate future situations. So this is really looking at the kind of reinforcement learning setting and you want to be able to imagine what's going to happen if I perform a particular sequence of actions without having to perform them because you know, in many cases having to, to, to do these things is prohibitively expensive but have, being able to imagine them is quite cheap. But I think really what it's about and what excites me about generative models and specifically about sequential generative models is that they give you a way of, of understanding the data. So just being able to model everything in the data forces your system to find the, the salient structure in the data. It forces the, 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 the network or whatever you're using to actually understand the data it's looking at. And I think that's kind of, that's the underlying the thing that underlies all of these other uh, benefits. So you, the reason you get better generalization if you, if you pre-train with a generative model is that you have a model that has learned more about the structure in the data. And the other really nice thing about generative models is by looking at what it generates, you can see uh, how much it is actually understood. And hopefully you'll get a feel for that from the, the, the examples that I show you. Okay, so in um, you know, practical terms, um, Generating sequences is, is 
is pretty straightforward if you have a uh, uh, as long as you have a predictive model. So basically, uh, the easy way to generate a sequence given a, 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 say a next step predictor is basically you just keep on predicting what's going to happen next in the sequence. And then after each prediction, you, you, you treat the last prediction you made uh, as if it was real. So in probabilistic terms, what we're talking about is just the conditional model here. The probability over this whole sequence x is just given by the product of the probabilities of each step in the sequence conditioned on everything uh, that happened previously. And the way I like to think of this is that you're asking your computer to dream. So like when you're dreaming, you're, you're, you're imagining some situation, and then it's being fed back into your kind of, uh, into your brain as if it had actually happened. You're saying, okay, you know, imagine that, that something could happen, and then say, well, if it really did, what would happen next? And, and I think this allows you, this allows you to, this iterative uh, process is what allows you to, to generate things that are really uh, rich and interesting. Um, and so the, the actual, so all of the experiments I'm going to show you are all based on the same architecture, really the same recurrent neural network. And the basic structure is actually pretty simple. So it's, it's a deep recurrent neural network that just means it's a recurrent, if, if, so I don't know if, how, how, if you're all familiar with recurrent neural networks in general, you know, essentially it's take a, a multi-layer perceptron and connect up the hidden layer to itself. So the hidden layer receives inputs from its itself one step back in time, and you've got a recurrent network. And a deep recurrent network is just the same thing with multiple hidden layers stacked on top of each other. And basically what we found is that the same advantages you get from having deep uh, feed-forward networks seem to carry over to recurrent networks. And so the, you know, the, the sort of topology looks like this. I, I like to use these skip connections where um, the, the, the information, the input uh, data is fed not only into the bottom hidden layer but into all the hidden layers and all of the hidden layers connect forward to the topmost layer. And the reason to do that is basically to make sure that you don't have these problems with, um, you know, uh, that you get with very deep networks when, when it's hard to propagate the gradients through lots of different layers because there's all these shortcut paths that this, the signals can take. And so as I say, it's, it's, it's a predictive model I'm using here, so it's always just next step prediction, essentially the task. The inputs from your sequence come in one at a time, and then the network predicts uh, the, the, uh, the input that's coming at the next time step. And predict here, what it really means is determine or parameterize a predictive distribution. So depending on the type of data, you're going to have a different predictive model uh, at the output layer of the network, uh, but that predictive model um, the, the parameters for that predictive model will, uh, will always come from the network. They'll just be the network outputs. And so the simplest case would be if you're doing, if you've got discrete, uh, if, you're, if you're predicting a sort of one of k discrete uh, symbol sequence, then your output is just going to be a softmax layer. And uh, what the network is going to do is just give the k numbers that are required to give you the k probabilities for the different classes. And then, you know, once you've defined this, the training is totally standard. It's just, it's just regular log loss. Um, or, or to look at it another way, it's, it's, uh, you're, you're, you're measuring the ability of the, of the, uh, of the network to, uh, to compress the data. So you're, you're just looking at the, the negative log probability of the, um, the, the input sequences given the model. And like I say, it's this, it's this conditional model. So you're always looking at the, the log probability of each step conditioned on the previous steps. And as I've said in the last slide, once you've trained this model, uh, generation is straightforward. You just keep on feeding an input and then sampling uh, from this output distribution, this probability of x given x from of you know 1 up to t minus 1. Pick a sample from that and then feed that in as your next x, of x sub t, your next input, rather than the real input. Okay, so, so it's, you know, it's a relatively straightforward architecture. But there, is, um, there are a few subtleties. And one of them is that you know, what people have found over the past, you know, recurrent neural networks were, were big news back in the 90s, and then they kind of died off. People stopped using them. And I think the main reason for this was that the standard sort of vanilla recurrent neural network just doesn't work very well. It doesn't do the thing it's really supposed to do, which is to, to store memory in its, uh, store information in this internal memory that it gets from having recurrent connections and you know, be able to sort of store and access that memory at will uh, over long time periods. And so long short term memory is a, a, an architecture that was introduced a long time ago now, 1997, to address this problem. And the idea was to design a network specifically around the idea of having information that you could, you could protect and, and having the ability to, to choose when you were going to read and write this information. 
And so uh, uh, this was implemented using these multiplicative gating units, which are, are illustrated in this diagram here. Don't worry too much about the kind of the, the you know, the exact topology here. So w w w one thing that's happened recently, LSTM has now become, after many years in the doldrums, LSTM has now become very popular. People are using it for all kinds of things, even at you know, commercial scale. And there are also a few um, alternative sort of variants of LSTM out there. Usually, the, the, thing, the thing that they always have in common is that they involve these multiplicative units, these, these, these gate-like units. And the way I like to think about LSTM intuitively is that basically these three gate units act like differentiable versions of read, write, and reset operations. So just to kind of go through that in a little bit more detail, um, this, 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 this point here is the input gate. And essentially that is just, uh, that's just a number. It's a number between 0 and 1. This is C from this unit here to the normal C point unit. And then that number multiplies the number that was received at this unit here. So you just take two ordinary sigmoid units, like you have in every recurrent neural network, and then multiply them together. Which doesn't sound, it sounds like kind of a trivial change, but it gives you uh, a much richer set of dynamics that the network can uh, instantiate. And in particular, what it can do is just, as long as it ensures that this number is very low, as long as that's zero, no information gets through into the cell. And that immediately gives the network, the cell being the kind of, the, 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 the place where the memory is stored within this subnetwork. And this immediately gives LSTM the ability to store information for much longer periods of time. Because what happens in a normal recurrent net, uh, neural net is that there's nothing to stop the uh, internal representation of the network, the memory of the network, being overwritten by new information coming in. And basically the, the other gates, the, the, the output gate and the forget gate, these kind of do analogous things only uh, so the, the, the output gate multiplies the output of the network to the, the rest of the, the system. So if the output gate is closed, no one can read what's in the state. If it's, if it's open, then that state can be read. And the forget gate, if that, uh, if that, as long as that remains open, the information remains in the cell. As soon as that closes, the cell is effectively reset. So uh, basically put together what these things do is give you a system that can, has much more introspective control over where and when it stores and accesses memory. And in practice, basically what this means is um, LSTM networks can do the things that RNNs were always supposed to do. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that soon. And so just to give, before I get into the experiments, just one more kind of uh, high level comment. I'd say, you know, it, it's kind of obvious that there's this, you know, these, this, is, this is a predictive model and, and, you know, the strength or failure of these models basically rests entirely on how good they are at predicting what's going to happen in the future. And it kind of is, is, it's kind of obvious to say, but, you know, you need memory in order to make predictions. You have to remember the past to predict the future. And there's lots of reasons why having a longer memory, so the, the type of memory that LSTM gives you is an advantage. So, you know, one of the most obvious ones is, well, if you have a long-range pattern. If you have some information that's spread out over a long period of time, you have to be able to, to accumulate that information, to integrate that information uh, over a long period of time in order to do anything with it. Basically, if you don't, if you don't have a long enough memory, then you're not going to be able to see the whole picture at once. And this is especially obvious when you look at disconnected patterns. And so one nice example would be uh, in, when you look at uh, text, uh, when, you, when you look at language data or, or you know, written text, um, you often have things like quotation marks and brackets, and if you look at the text in, if you look at the text between two brackets from a you know a normal sentence, nothing nothing in the text itself tells you that it's within a bracket. So in order to be able to remember where to close the bracket, you really have to keep track of the fact that you are in a kind of open bracket state. You know that what you're writing is now part of a of a parenthesis of a parenthetic clause, and. That's something that you know. You where you, that that's sort of a uh, that's something that will reveal whether or not your your system is able to to store a kind of discrete piece of information uh, over time. Um, and sort of uh, maybe the more the more profound point to make here is that the more the the more your system the the better use your system makes use the better your system makes use of its memory to make predictions, the more robust it becomes to prediction errors. And so what I mean by this. Uh, issue of prediction errors is that if you're generating a sequence by iteratively picking a sample from your model and then feeding it back in and picking another sample and feeding it in, what tends to happen is it works fine for a few steps and then you generate something that doesn't look anything like the training data it's seen before and from then on the, the model just breaks. It, it, it walks away from the 
the manifold where the training data lives and, and everything it generates from then on is garbage. And what I found in practice is that uh, long short term memory networks are much less prone to this than other nets. And I believe that's because they are using a much wider range of memory to make predictions. So they're using you know, the memory, of, of, let's say a very precise memory of the last few steps. Uh, but they're also using a more compressed memory of, of, of things that have happened over you know, different time scales, tens of steps or hundreds of steps. And so basically they're no longer going to break if just a few steps are wrong. Like in, in the network has to go sort of much more substantially wrong before it stops working completely. Okay, um, you know what? This is, I've just realized this is like I, I altered this talk slightly uh, this morning and somehow it's reverted to its earlier version. I, I, did, I had an extra slide about text generation, but maybe I'll, I'll start with the handwriting uh, experiments anyway, because this, this is possibly more interesting. So um, one of the, the two tasks that I applied this, this system to in the paper, uh, in the archive paper that I mentioned, was um, handwriting, online handwriting generation. And so just to explain what I mean by that, online handwriting is, is where you get... Um, pen trajectories, uh, you know, so someone is writing, say, on a tablet or something like that, and the trajectory of the pen as they write is stored. So you have basically just a series of, of coordinates for where the pen tip is, and that is, is your handwriting signal. And it's, you know, it's, it's a much nicer signal than taking, say, a photograph of someone's handwriting, and that it's, you know, it's very compact, it's very low dimensional, it's much easier to work with. You basically just have two coordinates per time step. Um, and the database that I used was, was this IAM uh, handwriting database uh, collected by the University of Bern. And um, it has, it's, you know, the, I guess the, the most interesting features of this are that it was, it's, it's, a multi, it's a data set with lots of different writers and it's very unconstrained. So it was actually recorded by people just writing on a whiteboard with a, a pen with an infrared sensor and the sensor recorded where the pen was as they wrote. And you can see from these samples here that it's, it's first of all, you can you know, clearly see that these were written by three different people who have three very different styles of handwriting. Secondly, you can see that it's kind of messy. There, there, are, there are some mistakes in there, you know, mistakes made by the people. There are also a few mistakes made by the, the scanners. Um, and they're just, you know, it, it has the normal kind of um, uh, diversity that you get in real handwriting. So this is as opposed to, you know, there are some data sets where people are, for example, told to, to write you know, isolated words or even isolated characters and to write very neatly. Um, and all of that made it much more interesting, in my opinion, as a, as a, you know, a test bed for a generative model. And so the, the first problem I faced when I came to this was, you know, how, do we, how do I deal with this continuous data? It's low dimensional, it's only two points at a time, but it's still real valued. And so like I, I already mentioned, um, the, the, the simplest, perhaps the simplest you know, variant of this predictive model just has a, a softmax layer at the output. It's, it's, it's designed for discrete data. Uh, and so the question is, what can I do to replace this softmax layer with another predictive model that will, that will work for um, continuous data? And the, the solution that I chose was to use uh, what are known as recurrent mixture density networks, which is it's kind of a fancy name. All it means is that the network outputs are used as the parameters for a mixture distribution, typically a mixture of Gaussians. Um, and just to, to kind of, uh, you, 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 you know, you've you probably heard about, you know, Gaussian mixture models before. This is a little bit different in that I'm not fi fitting a single um, mixture of Gaussians to an entire data set. Rather, the, the parameters emitted by the network at each point in time, which are conditioned on all of the inputs that it's seen so far in the sequence, are used to predict a, a specific mixture distribution. So it, essentially what you have is a different... Gaussian mixture model at every time step as you go through the sequence. So it's, I think, heteroscedastic. Is that right? Uh, there's, there's, some, there's some term for <laughs> statistical models that vary over time. There's something like that. But the, the way I like to think of it intuitively is that, you know, if you've got a Gaussian model with, with 20 components, uh, uh, you know, a mixture, a mixture of 20 Gaussians, then what you've got, the network has 20 choices for, for what, what kind of thing will happen next. It has, you know, 20 different modes that it can use, basically. And usually what you find is that's enough. So, you know, if you're fitting a single mixture model to an entire data set, you usually need a huge number of components. But if you're only fitting um, one data point at a time, conditioned on, on a previous uh, data point, then you don't need so many components. Um, yep. Okay. Oh, skip getting a bit ahead of myself. So 
basically, you know, that was I just I just defined this this network. So I this, this was this kind of uh, mixture density model was first considered by Mike Schuster in 1999. And I basically just took this thing and, and fed the handwriting data into it one step at a time and asked it to predict the next step. And I was very pleasantly surprised that it generated stuff like this. Uh, so you know, once it was trained and I, and, I, and I ran it forwards to generate. Now, obviously, that doesn't um, this doesn't make sense. In, you know, you, you can't you can't really you know, there's not like a, a a consistent sentence being written under here, but it has many of the like the important features that I really wanted from this kind of generative model. So first of all, you can kind of see that there's something like uh, a style for each of these lines of handwriting. Like they, they look like it, it does sort of look like each line was written by a different person, and the style seems to remain kind of consistent throughout the line. So like the third line is quite loopy, the first line is less cursive, and the letters are more separate. Um, but maybe well, even more fundamentally than that is the fact that it generates letters at all. In fact, it generates strokes. It generates letters, and it even generates whole words. So you can see the in there, for example. You know, the is obviously it's probably the most common word in English, the or a. Um, and so, just from you know, this was really encouraging to me that just at the level of predicting individual dots, it's generating these kind of um, high-level chunks in the data that exist at the sort of the the scale of maybe a hundred dots. Like so, for the word the, maybe it takes a hundred separate coordinates in a row to generate that. And so it was clear that the system was um, doing the right kinds of things for a generative model. And you can, uh, in this example at the bottom here, you can see that it actually learned how to swear as well. Which it, and that, that actually, is, it, that's an interesting point, because there, there's no swear words in the training set, but, <laughs> as far as I know. But, but there are, you know, what the network has learned, like SH is a common morpheme in English, it's, it's a common letter combination, and so is IT. So it's actually learn, it's learning to generate words out of common English morphemes, and you know, it just so happens. That, yeah. um, and, and another nice thing about, uh, you know, dealing with uh, this two-dimensional data uh, is that you can visualize it very easily. So you can, you can say, okay, you know, you can plot a two-dimensional heat map that tells you uh, how this this uh, how this mixture model actually distributed its its probability maps, and that's what I've done here. So basically, what we've got here is this is the the network predicting someone writing the word under, and uh, I've superimposed all the predictions on the same heat map. So each of these little blobs here is the prediction. So that blob there is the prediction that the network made when it was here, and so on. And this one here was made here always one step ahead. And um, those and, and what I mean by that being the prediction is that's the, the probability density that the network assigned to the position of the next coordinate is given by these, these like um, funny shaped blobs. And you can see, you know, it's a lot of things you can see straight away. I mean one of them is that there's kind of two separate modes here. So while uh, the pen is, is predicting a, is, is while the pen is on the paper and it's and it's and it's following a smooth stroke the, um, the the predictions are pretty precise, right? Because you know it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a continuum, and, and it has all this information about the gradient the pen was following before. It just has to kind of extrapolate from that. Um, and then there's these points here, these big these these big spread out plots, and basically those are the points when the pen's lifted off the paper. So the pen's position was not recorded while it was in the air; it was only recorded again once it was put back on the whiteboard. And so. Essentially, once the pen is lifted off here, the computer doesn't really know where it's going to be put back down. The person can do anything with it in the air and then put it back down. So it has to give this quite spread out prediction. And you can really see that, you know, in order to make a shape like that, it needs to use a bunch of these Gaussian components. And these things do not look like, um, you know, your, your average sort of axis aligned Gaussian blocks. So it's, it's, it, it uses the, the, the curvature that it's got quite a lot. Oh, and the other thing is at the bottom here, I think this, so this is done with 20 mixture components, and at the bottom here you have the mixture weights. And what you can see is that while it's in this kind of stroke regime, it's mostly just using three or four components, let's say. When it switches to the end of stroke regime, which is this bit here, it switches to a completely different set of components. So it has the ability to learn a kind of, a kind of switching model. And this was nice about having these mixtures, is it can, it can sort of separately optimize different modes for different regimes that the, the system might find itself in. Okay, well, 
that um, you know this was this was very interesting uh, but you know what I really wanted to do was was to actually generate handwriting that looked like handwriting in fact to be able to control what the handwriting was that the network produced so I wanted to tell it what to write without losing this nice distribution over the way it writes without having this this nice freely generated style uh, that, that we were getting from the, the, the generation and so in, in probabilistic terms what this really means is I want to to I wanted to condition <laughs> the next step predictions on a text sequence. And the challenge here was that uh, you don't know the alignment between the text and the writing. So the, the number of time steps required to write a single character could be as low as 10 or 15, or it could be as high as 100. Uh, and it's really not, there's no sort of, and because, you know, um, in, in, with cursive handwriting, people can write many characters in a single stroke, all joined up together. So there's no, there's no sort of, easy way of segmenting the writing into individual characters and defining this alignment. And you know, and also I didn't want to have to rely on a, on a pre-segmentation module because then again if there's some mistakes in the pre-segmentation module then those get transferred to your, your, your generative model. Rather I wanted the network just to be able to decide where it should attend in the text sequence. Essentially give it a, an, a, a, a differentiable um, attention mechanism for the text sequence. So before each prediction, the network just decides what, which character it's looking at and, and therefore which shape it's going to generate. And so the way this is done, like I always seem to have trouble, this slide never seems to, uh, <laughs> to work, but uh, essentially what I did was um, I allowed the network to output a, another mixture of Gaussians. And in this case, the, the, the Gaussians were, um, the Gaussians describe or define the attention, say, say the attention distribution of the network over the text sequence. So if you look at, if you look at, like, so basically the way those characters are actually represented to the network is just as one hot vectors, like kind of standard encoding. So this thing along the bottom is one hot vectors, that's, that's the text. And what the network has to decide is each time it makes a prediction, which of those vectors should I look at? And, and, I, and, and it, I should make it important distinction here, I wanted this all to be differentiable. So one way you could think about doing this would be to have an explicit decision like I'm looking at character three or I'm looking at character four, but then you're into the land of reinforcement learning and policy gradients and things like that. Uh, uh, I wanted to keep this like smooth uh, gradient so everything could be trained end to end. And so what I did was to find this Gaussian model where the network outputs the mean and the variance and the, let's say, the, the, the mixture weight of uh, a bunch of different components. And then these, the, these Gaussians are essentially convolved with the input. So you just get this, this sum, basically this sum over time that says, well, how much attention, this W value that's defined here, that basically says how much attention did the network give to the character at step, at step T, uh, rather at step I, at time T. So how much, how much attention, what's the attention weight uh, for character i? And then the final vector that it gets out is just a weighted sum over the one-hot vectors. So run over the one-hot vectors, multiply each one by the weight given to it by the attention module, and then uh, at the end you have a sum that is a kind of munged together version of these, of these different vectors. So it contains you know, more or less of, of each character depending on where, how these Gaussians are defined. And this is something that's, uh, this, this notion of attention is something that's in the last couple of years has is, is really been catching on. So Carol's also going to talk to you, I think, about an, an attention, a, a, dif a different kind of differentiable attention in the next talk. Uh, there have been other papers, some of you may have seen Joshua Bengio's machine translation paper. Um, it seems that this is something that's becoming a very, um, a big thing in machine learning in general is that you don't want to look at all of the data all of the time. You want to choose to focus in on a small part. And, and the network should be kind of free to learn how to do that. And so what happens when you do this, when you run this attention module? So here's an example where the, the text is written up the side. So this is the, the, the input text the network is conditioning on, and then the, the handwriting is along the bottom. And what this alignment does, what those, those Gaussians do, is essentially um, they define a kind of uh, an alignment curve between the, the text and the handwriting that shows, essentially shows, you know, at, at time step, at, at this time step, uh, you know, time step 20 or something like that, which character was I writing? It looks like it was writing the character H. 
is that the second step uh, there and and it's really it, it always gives these kind of clear cut this 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 clear kind of um, alignment band between the input and the output um, and okay you know, that's all very well but then the question is like does it actually generate good handwriting so I think Nando might have already showed you this slide but I'm going to test you on it again so uh, one of these one of these samples is real and the other ones were generated by uh, this RNN who, who can anyone tell me which one was real? Which one do you think? Just shout out. No, no. Really? This is, you know, strange. Every other time I've shown this one, everyone has told me that the last one was real and the others were fake. And that's actually true. Don't know what that says about you guys. But <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just that, you know, the screen's a bit fainter or something. <clears throat> and here's another one. Which one do you think this time? Don't be shy. Ah, you see, this is, this is like a psychological trick, right? <laughs> yeah. you know, because the, the big one at the bottom was right last time, you think that the big one at the bottom is right this time. It's not true. That one at the bottom was generated. I think it was the fourth one. Yeah, it's the fourth one was real this time. And so on. Oh, no, actually, I only, I'm only, okay, I'm limited myself to two slides here. As I'll tell you in a minute, there's an online demo for this, so you can try it out yourself just in case you, know, you don't believe me. Um, Another interesting thing you can do, uh, you know, once, you, once you've got this generative model that can generate these sequences, so you feed in text, it scans through the text, deciding where to look as it goes, and then it generates this, this handwriting, and then you can start mucking around with it, and that's kind of where it gets really fun. So uh, one thing you can do is, um, the, the, the method I've described so far is an unbiased sample uh, is drawn, like basically the, the, this, this predictive model defines implicitly a distribution over sequences. And these things are unbiased samples drawn from that distribution. But you can actually bias. I mean, one thing you, you could do, in fact, if, if, you, if you were thinking about a, a commercial application for this, you might not want a really noisy, messy kind of handwriting. You might want to get some nice, neat, kind of reliable handwriting. And one way to do that would be, instead of looking for, um, instead of looking for an unbiased sample, try to, try to get the mode, try to get the single most probable uh, sequence that the network thinks uh, would correspond to a particular, um, a particular text input. And um, to do that properly is actually kind of difficult, like maybe you need to do some sort of um, beam search or something like that, but there's a simple hack that gets you a lot of the way there, which is basically you just artificially reduce the variance of your um, predictive model at each time step. So you, you've got all these Gaussians with a, a particular variance, you say, okay, leave the, the means where they are and shrink down the variance. And basically what that means is that each of the samples you draw is closer to the mean than it would be normally. And what happens as you do that, as you increase this bias, is that the handwriting goes from looking like this stuff at the top or like any of the other handwriting samples we've seen towards this stuff at the bottom. And, and, and basically it always looks exactly like this, this handwriting at the bottom as you get you know, close to the mean, which I find kind of fascinating because I don't think, I don't think anyone in the training set has handwriting as neat as that. This is, this, it, what it's kind of like is a principal component of people's handwriting. Right? This, this is like, you take a whole bunch of handwriting, it's like these experiments with eigenfaces. Sorry. Isn't there a bias where, because of the fact that people are writing on the whiteboard, which is what people are writing on the piece of paper? Um, yeah, so I think the writing is probably worse overall than it would be, but I, I, most people still don't write as neat as that, right? I mean, maybe some people can, but it's, it's <laughs> it's very regular, but it's not perfectly regular. So you know, like when you first look at that, you might think, "Well, that's just one of those fonts that's supposed to look like handwriting." But if you look closely, you'll see that every S is different from every other S. Every E is different. Right? There is there is this small, still this small variation going on. Um, and it's it's as if so it's as if this is what you get if you if you averaged out lots of different people's handwriting and took the first component. You get this very neat. Uh, completely non-cursive. You notice that there's no, nothing's joined up here. Every, every letter is distinct. And then, presumably, the cursiveness and the slope and all of those other things, these would be other less prominent components if you could, you know, um, <coughs> if you could lay it out that way. Okay, and another interesting thing is, you know, so far, uh, in the, the stuff I've showed you so far, there was no control over exactly which style the network used. I thought it would be kind of nice to be able to say, okay, I don't just want random, I don't want handwriting in, in a random person's style, I want to choose a specific person's style and then you generate stuff 
that looks like that. And this actually works. So if you feed in, if the things in brackets are real handwriting that was fed into the network, and those are used basically to prime the network. So you run it through all of that uh, stuff without generating anything, just run that through, and then start generating. And what you find is that it internally stores the style that it's seen so far, and then uses that to, um, to generate some, some writing, which looks you know, at least passively similar to the stuff, the, the, the real stuff. And you know, obviously, the, you can see I chose two very distinct types of handwriting here, so you can really see that um, it's generating two different styles. One thing I have found, though, unfortunately, this only works with um, handwriting by people in the training set. So unfortunately, it, it, I can't just take a random sample of someone's handwriting, feed it into the net, and then get it to generate in that style. Which means it's not as useful for ransom notes and things like that as people, people had hoped. Um, and actually, you can combine the two as well. You can say, okay, um, take, give me someone's handwriting, give me a real sample of the handwriting, and then generate uh, in their style but bias the generation so that it's, it's, it's biased towards the mode. And what it does is it generates something that looks like a cleaned up version of the original. So like stuff that tops the real writing and then at the bottom it's like this neaten version, which I don't know, could be interesting. Um, especially for people like me who have terrible handwriting, I'd be interested to see what it could do. And yes, as I say, this is all, um, this is all available online so you can, you can get it to, to, you know, you type in text and it generates stuff and you can play around with these bias parameters and, and the priming a little bit just to get a feel for it. Okay, so um, how am I doing for time? Like about halfway through? No, that clock's wrong. Uh, 20 minutes. No, it's not wrong. Oh, there's like 15 minutes left. Okay, so I need to speed up in other words. Well, so, um, you know, this is a very generic system, right? All I'm doing is taking data and predicting what comes next. So there's no reason that it's, there's nothing about it that was really specific to handwriting, except that, you know, the, the, the predictive model that I used was two-dimensional because I had these two-dimensional data points. So I thought, well, what's a, a, you know, another task to apply it to? And an obvious one is speech synthesis, or text-to-speech, because, it, you know, it has basically the same format. You want to, you give some text in, and then you want to generate some, uh, some, some speech that sounds like a you know like a real person, and so instead of going from letters to to pen positions, you're going from letters, well, you're going from from letters to audio, uh, and there's several reasons why this is this is harder than than handwriting synthesis. So one arguably is that you know there's this intermediate representation, especially for language like English. The map from letters to sounds is you know notoriously. Um, inconsistent and really what you want to do is get to this phonetic representation of, of the sound first. But that can be, you know, you can do that as a sort of pre-processing step reasonable. There are like pronunciation dictionaries and things like that. I think another thing is that arguably um, people are more sensitive to garbled speech than they are to handwriting. So I mean if you if you think that, you know, if you if you if you spoke, if you if someone spoke spoken language that is the equivalent of that handwriting, I think, would sound kind of slurred and, and, and indistinct. You'd sound like you were drunk or something like that. And, and you know, this line at the top here, you know, people will tolerate this kind of thing in writing, or they, they, they expect it, but I think for speech, because speech is more, basically more important to us as a mode of um, communication, I think we have higher expectations. But actually, the biggest problem is just with the data itself. So instead of having this nice, compact, you know, two, uh, two real numbers per time step, you have this High dimensional data that, that takes, you know, it's, 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 there's a lot of different ways that you can represent a speech signal, and all of them are difficult. So, just to give you an example, uh, well, what, you know, one thing you can look at, the simplest thing is the raw waveform itself. I haven't even drawn that on here, but the problem with that is that, you know, you have 16,000 samples a second or something. So, you have an enormous, you have, you'll, you'll have enormously long sequences if you do that. So, generally, people look at some sort of transform of the data. And really, they're mostly based around Fourier transforms or you know, spectrogram. If you're not familiar, a spectrogram is basically just a windowed Fourier transform. You take, you take a bunch of Fourier transforms of different kind of windows of the data and then you, you um, uh, basically amalgamate them together. And then people in traditionally in, in speech uh, recognition use the kind of simplified version of a spectrogram called mal, -capstral, mal frequency capstral coefficients. Uh, there's a little bit more to it than that. Basically what you do is you start with the spectrogram and then you do this, this transform that's shown in the, in the second row there, 
which uh, basically has this kind of, it, it, it shifts around the frequencies so that they're more in line with the way we actually hear frequencies, or at least that's the, princi the principle behind it. And then you do all this kind of, um, like the actual Mel transform is like a transform of a transform, uh, but it's not, really, it's not really important. I'm just sort of showing you this to show you how, how many choices there are and how complex it is. And then another, the one that's more practical for text-to-speech are these kind of vocoder-based um, uh, representations, which really, they're like a, a mixed bag of tricks. They include a lot of things. They include this, these MFCCs. They include information about whether this, the signal is periodic or aperiodic, voiced or unvoiced, the, the fundamental frequency, um, harmonics, things like that. They're really engineered towards you know, uh, the, the mechanics or the, 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 the acoustics of speech. Um, and so, you know, I started off um, just trying to, to match spectrograms, and basically that worked pretty well, uh, or at least it generated things that looked good. So, you know, <laughs> to the naked eye, you know, th this thing at the top is, is a real spectrogram, the things underneath are generated spectrograms from the same speech signal. And if you kind of squint, you, 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 you can, it's, it's hard to tell, but it, it seems that there's some, you know, consistency in the patterns here. You can see it a bit more, uh, oops. Oh, no, this is this is really the wrong. I've, I, you know, I've loaded up the wrong uh, presentation here. I'm sorry, guys, but it's it's not very different. <laughs> um, you, you can see it a little bit more clearly when you look at the um, the uh, the filter banks. But anyway, and and you you also get this nice alignment again. So you you have an alignment between the the, the text and the sound, and again you get this this curve that shows you you know where the network is attending to in the text sequence when it's generating a particular sound. But the important thing, of course, is how does it sound? Um, and so I'll play you some samples of that now. So let's, yeah, just to start off, the first thing I did again, as with the handwriting, was just um, to predict, do next step prediction without using any uh, text sequence to condition it. So I'm basically just letting it generate random speech without telling it what to, to say. I forgot to check. There's no, there's no way I can get this into speakers, right? Because I don't think anyone can hear that. Ah. Okay, it goes slightly louder than that. Maybe the people at the front should be able to hear this. So, <laughs> I go play this one as well because it has the word terrorist. The phone will on and send and they did attend to using the same and then it did the sermon by disunitain non brands and the terrorist. They cut. So, you know, again, it, as with the handwriting, you can say that it's it's generating something that has speech like qualities and occasionally has recognizable words. And, you know, terrorist is an odd one, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, all the rest of it's just a smoke screen, you know. So. But um, you know, obviously, it's not it's not forming whole words. It's just getting this. It's a babble, basically. It's learning like a, like a kind of like a child's babble. And this was all trained, I should say, on a, on a database with a single speaker. So unlike the last one with lots of different people, there's a single American female speaker. And I'll show you what she sounds like. Really, this is like a real sample of her. He also worked early with Joan Littlewood Theatre Workshop at the Theatre Royal in Stratford, London. So did anyone, everyone understand what that said? He also worked early with Joan Littlewood Theatre Workshop at the Theatre Royal in Stratford, London. Okay, and then here's the network trying to say the same thing. He also worked early with Joan Littlewood Theatre Workshop at the Theatre Royal in Stratford, London. So you can hear it's a bit like theater royal, like the, the, the prosody, like the, the tone of voice sounds kind of the same and the words are recognizably there, but there's something about the, the, the intonation or the prosody that's kind of random. I'll tell you another example. So here's the real, te real thing. But she rebounded with the critically acclaimed 2000 album Reconstructing Alice. So I should say that, I mean, this is real data that sounds almost mechanical to start with. I think part of the problem is that for these speech Synthesis uh, data sets, they tell the speaker to be as um, flat and, un you know, to, to remove as much intonation as possible so it's easier to model. So I think it would be more interesting to take more natural speech. Uh, but anyway, then what is it? it? Generates. But she rebounded with the critically acclaimed 2000 album Reconstructing Alice. 
I'll play you a couple of samples from the same thing, so you can see that there's this... But she rebounded with the Critical Eagle 2000 album, Reconstructing Ellis. <laughs> so they're all kind of the same, but the, you know, the emphasis... <laughs> but she rebounded with the Critically Acclaimed 2000 album, Reconstructing Ellis. Um, and actually this, so the other things I've shown you, let me get back to, what is it, Keynote? Where are you? Here you are. So the, the, this, this, these experiments have never been published anywhere. I sort of, I got halfway with this and, and never finished it. Uh, I guess the feeling was that for text-to-speech to really be useful, it has to be, um, it has to be really convincing. You know, it has to be better than Siri, better than whatever is, is in Android right now. And it, it needs a bit of work. Um, and yeah, so I've got a bit of time here, so I'm going to show you some more videos. Okay, here's the first one. Sorry, I'm skipping the slide. So this, just to give a preface here, um, after I, you know, when I, when I first published this thing with handwriting generation, I was, I was quite pleased with myself, and I thought I'd done something really, you know, uh, groundbreaking and new, and then Jeff Hinton sent me this video. One of the most remarkable realizations of CAM technology is a device in the shape of a small boy. It's perhaps the world's most astonishing surviving automaton. What's on this card is a piece of writing made by a 240 year old machine. So I was scooped by almost a quarter of a millennium. <laughs> <laughs> don't, we don't have time to show this whole thing, but what's really amazing about this uh, machine is not only you know, did it write by actually like, you know, dipping the pen and ink and writing on the page, it was programmable, so you could, you could choose which, which words it wrote. No when he designed and built this masterpiece. Inside the boy are almost 6,000 parts. What's astonishing is that every one of these crafted components has been refined and miniaturized to fit completely inside the body of the boy himself. What Jacques Edroz did was to use the technologies of homeostasis, of miniaturization, to build really a true automaton. Inside the little writer is all his source of energy and all the machinery that drives him. He works on his own. You can look that up on YouTube. It's the writer automaton. Um, I guess so. I guess I'm pretty much out of time, right? Should I show the Atari videos, or do you want to show those? Carol? You don't have them. Okay, so let's look those up. And this might take me a minute to find. So this is, this is kind of similar work uh, in sequence generation. It was done by Carol here, along with a bunch of other people at DeepMind. And uh, the idea here was to actually generate video. So it's, 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 it's video from the screen of, a, of an Atari game. It's not you know, like natural video. 
Um, but it's kind of incredible what it does. So, how do I do this side by side? Okay. Okay, start them both running. Okay, so on the left is real uh, data from, what's the game called again? Enduro. Enduro, yeah, from the, the game Enduro for the Atari. And, you know, obviously it's, it's pretty primitive compared to modern computer games. Uh, but that made it easier to model as well. And uh, on the right is stuff being generated by uh, an LSTM network that's doing the same kind of next step prediction. Generating a frame, feeding it in as input, and then generating the next frame. It's a much more complicated generative model that I'm not going to, to describe. But you know, the basic sort of temporal component is the same. And it's really interesting to see what it does. So the first thing you notice is that it gets the car, the, 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 it has a kind of um, egotistic worldview. So the, the car, which is the, the player that you control, is, is pretty accurately rendered. Uh, the road that it's driving on looks fairly convincing, but it gets a little bit blobby and blurry sometimes. The mountains in the background look quite similar. The one thing that doesn't fit is the cars coming past. So you know, whereas they're obviously like discrete shapes that, that move smoothly along, in the real data there are these kind of blurry clouds in the generated data, and they appear and disappear. But it's really, what's really fascinating is you're kind of getting a peek into the, the mind of the, of the computer here. You can see which, which elements of the data it's actually learned and which elements it's kind of approximated with some sort of, um, you know, some sort of vague, uh, vague blurred out prediction. And every so often you can see that the screen kind of goes crazy. And it, it, this kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier about robust prediction. So this point when the screen starts to kind of flicker and stuff like that is the point when most generative models break. They don't recover from that because you're showing them something that they've never seen in training. But LSTM manages to recover from it because it has this longer range memory. And so the way I like to think, you know, if you imagine that you were a human being whose whole, you know, sensory experience of the world came from low-resolution Atari games, then <laughs> maybe your dreams would look something like this. And here's another example. So this one is River Raid, right, Carol? Um, and so we only modeled kind of a, a letterbox of the screen here for technical reasons. Um, but, you know, so sorry, just to go back, that's, that's the most interesting thing that happens right there. So um, again, you know, you can see the, the sort of similarity between the generated and the real one. But what I want you to look at is what's coming up right now on the generated part. You see that it, it flew into something and died. So it died inside its own dream. And it, after it died, it went, it went back to the star. So it replayed this, um, it, that's, that sort of starting segment when you see the, the parallel lines, it replayed that. So it has this, this you know, it, 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 it's learned a lot about what happens in the game. It knows that if the ship flies into something, then the, the level restarts. And when the level restarts, there's this particular pattern that appears. And there was even a version of this uh, done by, by Ivo Danny Helke, who, where he predicted the, as well as predicting the next frame uh, that, you would, that, that would be observed by the agent, he predicted the action. And what this meant was that while you were generating it, you could control, you could press left and right, and the thing would actually move left and right in the dream. So it's like the equivalent of a lucid dream where you can control the actions. And what was really interesting is it wasn't reliable. You press left, it would usually go left, but not always. So it had this kind of stochastic relationship. But anyway, um, you'll hear more about this sort of model from Carol in the next talk. And I think I should stop there. <laughs>